Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Workplace Gender Equalities Accelerating Change in Gender Equality uh, event that we have today. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity at the start to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the many lands around the country that we meet on today. Uh, they have loved and nurtured the land for thousands of generations, and we pay our respects uh, to them for that. We have so many people from around the country today participating in, in this session. So thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, we're very excited to be able to uh, have this session today. I do want to take uh, the opportunity to let you know that the session is being recorded and it will be published on YouTube and on our website. Um, if you want to tweet uh, or post on LinkedIn uh, while we're underway or afterwards, uh, please do. Um, we just ask, hopefully, that you'll tag the WGE agency, so WGEA, um, as uh, part of that uh, social media engagement. So today we're looking to discuss how to accelerate improvement in workplace gender equality. And what we know is we have been making progress, but it has stalled. The gender pay gap has been at 22.8% for the last two years. Uh, and we need to work out how to re-engage and get that momentum again. There has been um, uh, you know, some, some progress, as I've said, but we have a phenomenal panel today um, to be able to engage on this issue. We have the Minister for Women and three top CEOs, all of whom are well-placed to talk about their leadership, their motivation and their experiences in driving gender equality. Now, the context for today's session is that we are announcing our new employers of choice for gender equality uh, citation recipients and recognising all of those who hold that citation. The employer of choice citation <clears throat> is our lead, leading practice recognition program of employers who make gender equality a integral commitment and part of their workplace and their business processes. They're taking significant action to improve it, and they know that it's absolutely critical to their success. The EOCGE is a rigorous evidence-informed process that examines the key drivers of workplace gender equality and how they relate to an employer and an organisation and the work that they're doing. The EOC citation continues to evolve, so the hurdle and the bar always gets higher, uh, making sure that those who receive it are always progressing. Now, on your screens are a list of names of our citation holders. And I do want to particularly acknowledge those who are new this year for the first time, because it is quite a significant hurdle uh, and challenge to uh, be successful in being awarded uh, the EOCGE citation. Um, and we have a number as well. There's 11 new and there's 14 um, who are renewing their uh, citation this year. We then have another 104, and the names will go through your screen, who are um, ongoing, who were successful last year and who uh, it's a two-year process, so they continue to hold it um, at the moment. Just to give you a sense, it covers, uh, the citation holders cover more than or about half a million employees, and we have some of Australia's largest employers, such as Woolworths and Coles, and also some of our smallest uh, reporting organisations like Plenary Services and AT Kearney, who both have less than 150 uh, employees. While the bulk of the recipients are in Victoria and New South Wales, we actually have six states and territories represented across uh, uh, with uh, citation holders. And we cover um, all, uh, just about every industry. Um, our largest industries are professional, scientific and technical services, financial services, wholesale trade and manufacturing. So all areas that you know, often have very significant gender pay gaps and need to be working to address exactly these issues. And that's the leadership we're saying. And what we see from the EOC citation is that it does get results. So um, on average, the gender pay gap uh, for EOC citation holders is six percentage points lower than those who don't. There's more women on the governing bodies. They have longer parental leave. And their men's take up of parental leave is actually substantially higher. And their employees confirm that they do have a genuine commitment and environment where gender equality is supported for all employees and a zero tolerance in relation to uh, things like sexual harassment and discrimination. So um, 
our, our EOC citation holders do recognise that this is part of the journey, not the end of the journey, and that they aren't perfect. They can continue to improve, but they've got a commitment and a leadership to it. And in fact, one of the most common points that we hear is they wish that they had have got onto these issues earlier and been more proactive in terms of their work in relation to improving gender equality. So now I want to take uh, the opportunity to let you know what's going to happen. We're going to hear from the minister shortly. Um, then we're going to be follow, uh, followed by the panel um, with the three leading CEOs. You can submit questions uh, in, your, in the Q&A button, uh, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and we'll do our best to try and uh, answer as many of those questions from the panel uh, as we can through the process. So very pleased to be able to um, engage the audience in the things that you want to hear from, from the panelists, as well as the questions we have. So what I'd like to now do is take the opportunity to introduce uh, the minister who will be speaking um, with us and, and answering a couple of questions herself as well. Now, Katie Gallagher is well known, I'm sure, to many of you, if not all of you. She's a leader, she's a reformer, she's passionate about social and economic progress as a way to help people's lives and, and make a real difference. She was Chief Minister of the ACT from 2011 to 2014, and she led a, a very a significant number of very progressive and future-focused reforms in that role. She became a senator for the ACT in 2015, and of course last year, um, with the change of government, was appointed the Minister for Women, Finance and the Public Sector. I'd now like to hand over to Minister Katie Gallagher. Hi everyone, sorry we had a few technical difficulties there. Um, Mary, uh, to you and the panellists, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity just to jump on for uh, a short while and uh, really, I guess, lend my support to everything that Wajia is doing uh, and thank very much all of um, employers, organisations that engage with Wajia um, and help drive uh, gender equality in this country. Uh, we know it's a huge um, economic disadvantage not to realise the full potential of, of women and women workers. Uh, and it's an important, you know, I can't say how much importance uh, rests on the work that Wajia does. And by that, um, all the work uh, that you are doing places uh, to drive gender equality. So I, Mary, I don't want to take too much time up. I wanted to jump on Thank everybody. Acknowledge that those that have um, gone for uh, the citation, the accreditation through the scheme, we know that when that, that effort's going in, it actually is driving um, great progress towards gender equality um, in terms of um, closing the gender pay gap, in terms of women's leadership and women's engagement in the workplace. So I also wanted to just, again, thank people for that. Thank uh, the leadership of, of those employers. Um, I think from the APS point of view, we are joining, finally joining the arrangement so that what you've been doing for a fair while now will also fall on the shoulders of the APS leadership. I'm very excited about that. And I would hope that many of them would try and reach, um, you know, get to the standard that many of you have chosen to follow because there's work to do in the public sector as well. And uh, we've dropped the ball a bit there and um, we're back at the table. But Mary, thank you for having me on and thanks for persevering with the APH internet problems, which always <laughs> happen. Surely, um, surely there's a minister that could uh, do some work uh, to fix that, you would hope. <laughs> can't or, tell you how we need our own mobile black spot program in here, this building. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Minister. Can a couple of questions for you just to, to get your responses. Um, as Minister and the government has committed to Australia being one of the best countries in the world for gender equality, um, what's the government's role and what's government doing to help to achieve that? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, well, um, obviously, Wajia is a part of that. So we've got some legislation in the parliament now, which we've worked on with you about um, closing the gender pay gap and requiring a bit more transparency and public reporting in that regard. But we're, I've just jumped off with another uh, virtual meeting with the Women's Economic Equality Task Force that's doing, um, providing a 13 amazing women who are providing advice to me as the Minister for Women, but also Minister for Finance um, 
in terms of budget priorities and really what we can do um, through, you know, across government uh, to drive gender equality um, and prioritise within that. Obviously, there's a fair bit to do. We've had the budget measures we put in last year around um, making childcare more, more affordable and, of course, increasing over time the PPL scheme and looking at ways we can make shared care a bit more of a focus in that scheme. So looking at some incentives around that because obviously we're wanting to drive up the participation of the second parent um, in that arrangement. Um, we've got, we, I think the first, um, one of the first piece of ledge that went into this parliament was for paid domestic um, and family violence leave. That's passed, that came into effect on the 1st of February. So wish we didn't need it, but the reality is we do and that's in place now. So hopefully give, giving women a few more choices um, if they are in the position where they're having to leave um, and make those really difficult choices. And then we've got a whole, we did the respect at work. I'm in charge of setting the standard in our workplace because our workplace has been proven to be um, not great when it comes to the experience of, of women um, in this workplace. So I'm doing some work there as well. Uh, so there's, and we've got our national strategy for gender equality, again, uh, which we're trying to put in place by the end of this year really to have a whole of government focus on how we drive towards this and the national priorities that sit underneath it. So just a few things there, Mary. <laughs> it's a long, absolutely a long list and a, and a busy agenda. And Minister, from your perspective, what role then does the private sector play? Yeah, well, the private sector obviously plays a huge role. I mean, you know, certainly for women in work and their experience at work, we know, you know, women spend as employees spend, a, you know, a significant proportion of their day at work. Um, you know, I think that personally, I think the private sector has been leading the way in many in many regards in terms of driving some of this, the cultural and uh, change, but also the conditions change, you know, entitlement change that we know makes a difference for women. So we are looking, as I'm embarking on some, um, you know, bargaining arrangements in the public sector, I'm actually looking to the private sector at some of what they're doing there um, in leading the way on flexibility at work, on, you know, and that can be a whole range of things. It's not just working from home. It's, you know, hours of work. Um, it's being able to, to change those as you need to, but also on, you know, entitlements that support women as carers. Um, I think there's a lot for the public sector to learn. Um, but I would just urge the private sector to keep that healthy competition going um, to drive, you know, the change that they have been leading, really. Fantastic. And, Minister, it's nearly a year that you've been Minister for Women, but you've been a champion for these issues um, for a long time. Um, what is it that motivates you to lead on gender equality? Well, I think like all of us, Mary, and particularly of a certain age, like we have been involved for a while in, in this policy space. And I think every now and again, we can get a bit disheartened about the pace of progress. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, when you sort of take stock, I have noticed a change in my lifetime, in my career about, um, you know, about gender equality, certainly in the numbers of women um, in my line of work has changed, that has, the cha that has changed the nature of the work I do. But I think what keeps me involved is the fact, and, and sometimes personal as well, you know, in the sense that I've got two daughters who I, I want to see enter a world that was a, is a bit easier on them than it was on me. Um, but also I think from the point of view of social change, we are you know, we are small parts of a much longer journey and I'm doing the Susan Ryan oration tomorrow in Canberra. <clears throat> There's a whole range of International Women's Days of events which make you reflect on this. Uh, but I think when I, I was reading Susan's memoir in the lead up to this speech, um, there was the line that kept entering my head was some things change and some things stay the same. But also the fact that, you know, we're all part of a much bigger uh, piece of work here. Um, so... We've all got a role to play and I will hand the baton on to someone else in the future and each time we do that, we're, we are moving forward and that's what motivates me to stay inside and keep pushing. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you for your leadership. We're obviously very excited about the 
Wajia reforms that uh, you're leading and uh, will be that are in in front of the parliament currently and and some more work to come and um, your leadership across the board the national strategy is um, uh, very needed and and will be a wonderful framework I think for all of us in terms of um, the work to to really accelerate change which is the aspiration that we have so thank you for your leadership and thanks for being part of today to um, uh, both discuss the topic but also celebrate our um, our new citation holders really appreciate it thanks yeah thanks very much Mary and can I say I'm hoping that the Wajia legislation is actually the straight a straightforward experience in the Senate unlike many of the pieces we deal with but and um, thanks for your involvement in that and pushing it along it's really important wonderful thanks a lot very good. Uh, it's been it's great to have the minister with us, and um, as you can tell, it's a very very busy agenda um, from the government perspective, but obviously uh, hand in glove with the the leadership and the work from the private sector as well. I'm now going to turn to our panel. I look forward to introducing uh, each of our panel members. So first of all, we've got James Warburton, who's the managing director and chief executive officer of Seven West Media. Uh, James was appointed to that role in 2019, and before that, uh, he was the Chief Executive Officer of APN Outdoor, and before that, of the Supercars, um, which sounds like a, um, a, a fun role as well. Uh, Seven West Media is one of our most prominent media companies uh, and became an employer of choice for gender equality uh, last year and was the first media company to be awarded the citation. So welcome, James. Our second panellist is Liz Kanabuchi, who's the Vice President, Enterprise, Accounts and Services, Japan and Australia, New Zealand, and the v Vice President of Diabetes, APAC and Greater China for Medtronic. Um, your business card must be very full. No, no room for notes on the front of that business card with your long title, Liz. Um, Liz, you've been, uh, Liz has been at uh, Medtronic uh, since uh, 2019 and has taken on a variety of roles uh, in, uh, in that time, uh, culminating in the position and leadership role you've got now. Uh, Liz previously has been at Beckton Dickinson, at Care Fusion, and a long time at Baxter Healthcare as well. Uh, Medtronic is a global leader in medical technology, services and solutions, uh, treating more than 70 health conditions. And Medtronic became an employer of choice for the first time uh, last year as well. Um, although I think there was a bit of a break, uh, it might have been 10 or 15 years ago you were one uh, as well. So great to um, have you back in the uh, citation family. And our third panellist is Ben Pollock, who's the Chief Executive Officer at Urbis. Um, ben became CEO at Urbis in 2016 uh, and before that uh, has um, had a range of roles in professional service firms across legal, accounting, consulting and the real estate sectors. Um, Urbis is an interdisciplinary consulting firm that in, and uh, capacity includes planning, design, property, social planning. Um, seems to be a very th strong theme and, and always about shaping cities and communities for the future. Um, Urbis is announced as a new employer of choice for gender equality today. So it's a special congratulations and recognition to you, uh, Ben, um, and uh, Urbis for becoming a new uh, EOC GE. So welcome to the panel. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to kick off with a question um, and we might start with you, James, um, but, but all of the panelists are here because you've been recognised uh, as a leading employer in gender equality. Can you give me an example of one initiative, one of the key initiatives that has improved gender equality in your business and, and what were the outcomes? How did you measure its impact? How do you know that it's working? So James? Yep. Um, well, thank you, Mary, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, congratulations, Ben. Um, you know, well, welcome. Um, you know, I think from our perspective, Mary, uh, you know, we had a, a strategy and in fact a focus to actually get the Wajia citation. And we tried three times and we were successful on the third attempt, you know, so first time around, I think we failed on three or four areas, you know, where our policies weren't clear or we hadn't done enough. The second time, you know, we failed on something that was quite, you know, sort of minuscule, but important. And then obviously the third time around. And, and so each time it drives, you know, a huge array of continuous improvement in the business. Um, putting the metrics into your scorecard, you know, having KPIs set 
not just for you know sort of gender balance but also in terms of leadership positions and so you know that's led us to being focused on it uh you know for managers and and for you know sort of certain areas of the business you know across the whole you know range of areas to have that focus and you know i'm pleased to say we have a 50 50 um balance in terms of gender from seven west but we have a 52 percent 48 percent in the in positive favor in terms of female focus from leadership positions so i think putting it into your kbis and driving that through the company you know it's probably not expected uh you know at that type of level for a you know for a media company which is great for us and have you had any roadblocks um in that journey uh or you know and and how do you overcome them because people you know come up with barriers all the time on these things yeah, I mean, for us, it's been about, you know, talking openly. So I think if you think about, you know, sort of seven, you know, there had been a previous issue with the CEO. Media companies have tended to be viewed as, you know, blokey and, you know, th you know, those types of things. And so I think, you know, you have to drive it from the top. And there's probably, you know, a range of people that wouldn't even necessarily believe that it was possible, you know, to achieve, uh, you know, what we've achieved. And, you know, so you have to drive it. Um, sometimes you've just got to be really open about, you know, things that sometimes are difficult to talk about and you have to be very honest, very transparent, um, admit where you've been failing, um, you know, push in the areas that actually mattered. And, you know, then the organisation itself really takes over and you really start to see it become, you know, something that's important. And it's not important to get a citation. It's important in our case because that's what drives our business, you know, our clients, the expectations of the community. And more importantly, what we show on screen in all forms of diversity, you know, if we're if we're skewed in a, you know, not reflecting society, then no one's going to watch, you know, our leading programs and, you know, news bulletins, etc. So those things are really, really important, um, you know, in, in, in driving the agenda, so to speak. Thanks, James. Liz, how about you? Has there been, um, you know, a key initiative that stands out in your mind um, that's really helped? And, and, you know, how have you measured that? Yeah, thanks, Mary. And um, first of all, huge congratulations to everybody new to the citation and those renewing also congratulations. Um, so uh, look, I completely agree with uh, with what James has mentioned there. And I think for us at Medtronic, um, it's very much around, uh, you know, having those uh, mechanisms in place that are really going to help drive this as well. So, um, you know, we created a framework for all employees. So some of our initiatives um, really spoke to specific ID and E goals that we have. Um, we have those specifically at the manager and above um, level for individual targets. And, uh, and they're really around improving uh, gender equity across their teams. And we've got a We've got a pretty bold goal um, to to have 46% there by 2026. So um, we're all moving towards that. We do a couple of other things as well. So we've got um, training through a global inclusion training, uh, leadership training program, I should mention. Um, and then uh, that recognition's provided through a performance-based pay increase and incentives for our leaders as well. But the key thing is that that framework really kind of cascades down to every single person at Medtronic. And um, and so every employee um, has what we call a how goal. Um, and our how goals are really around building that culture and making sure that we've got that mindset and that approach built into everything that we're doing. So um, we have um, we ask everybody to, to personally contribute to an ID and E goal and, and they're responsible for putting that into smart actions. Um, and that's how we we, um, we can kind of um, see what people are, are, are committing to and how we support them there as well. So, um, we, of course, as I mentioned there, um, tying a lot of that leadership to incentives around our equity goals, um, and, and that's made it very loud and clear. Um, we also are pretty strong on reporting out on our metrics, our key metrics. So just as an example, um, we have number of female applicants um, shortlisted at the screening stage, um, just one metric that we use. Um, we've got a ton of others, but that's probably a good one to start with. And um, it really means that we're driving efforts in some of these really um, granular goals that we have. So, and doing that at the earliest stages of all of those wonderful people that, that come and have a, uh, you know, a career and employ, um, uh, uh, you know, a life cycle 
stage with us at Medtronic. So um, happy to say our diverse uh, slate shortlist goal was set at 70%, but we managed to get above that, 72. So uh, good job, team. Um, and then also, um, a little bit like James mentioned, we've certainly got um, diversity slating of managers and above, um, and we've got a pretty hefty target there of 90%. So we're asking um, a lot of our leaders to really make a, a strong commitment as it relates to um, some of those initiatives around gender equality. Great. And what about roadblocks for you? Is, is there a roadblock or two that you want to sort of flag and how you dealt with it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I think a little bit like James too, um, we've got pretty balanced gender equality at Medtronic. We've got 52% um, female uh, representation and 48% male. But um, for us, over 40% female uh, representation at management positions. Um, but we do have a little bit of a roadblock that, that we kind of uncovered, um, which was really around some of the female applicants um, dropping off for more of those senior positions. Um, so we kind of gathered that through the data from our organisational health and engagement survey, but together with our uh, Medtronic Women network uh, and the data that came out of the survey, um, we created an emerging female project and that allowed us to go even deeper to find out why and what was going on um, so that we could understand better and really support the employees and the leaders uh, in terms of addressing, um, you know, where we where we saw that uh, that drop, drop off happening. And uh, we've got a couple of programs that we've initiated as a result of that. So flexible working, job sharing, policy reviews we've done. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the balanced um, talent slates. Um, and then, of course, we, we certainly have our leaders behind that, raising awareness and support for their employees as well. So um, good news is um, through so many of those things, we've in increased our representation of executive leadership um, for women to 54%. And, um, and we've definitely increased our uh, female representation in people leader roles by 2%, so uh, compared to last year. So that, uh, that certainly seems to be, to be working our end. But I think there's still a little bit of a, a perception gap um, between, you know, some of the reality and, and what we actually see. So again, totally engaging our leaders here. Um, and we've come up with diversity scorecards a little bit like what James was talking about. And we certainly evaluate um, our executive leaders. We have that as part of a quarterly business review. And we certainly help our leaders wherever we can um, as they are reporting out on, on uh, a lot of that scorecard. So a bit of a roadblock, but hopefully we're, we're still moving towards uh, addressing that. As the minister says, it's definitely a journey that we, that we all keep continuing on. Fantastic. Thanks, Liz. And over to you, Ben. Same questions. Yeah, look, um, thank you. And thanks, Mary. And thanks, everyone. And, and we're um, very delighted to be joining the uh, citation group. And congratulations to the other 130-odd um, citation holders. Um, I thought I'd take a slightly different perspective. We've um, This is the first time we've applied for the citation. Obviously, for some time, had a number of things in place, like um, targets, uh, pay equity reviews and so on. But one of the things we've implemented more recently um, is aligned with our aspiration of a 40-40-20 um, balance and all our leadership groups, was we created, particularly with our board, a diversity seat. Um, so our board is a little bit different. We operate under a partnership type model where um, our employees or our employee shareholders elect our board. So it's not a, a board built by the chair. Um, and in order to meet that target, uh, one of the initiatives we introduced was the creation of a diversity seat uh, to help us achieve that, that goal. So uh, initially, uh, and for now, um, that is targeted as a female only seat. So only females can be elected into that seat to ensure that we achieve that, uh, that gender balance amongst um, our most senior governance group. But it also provides the scope in the future for us to then look at other areas of diversity, whether it be cultural, whether it be age or so on. So I thought I'd, I'd share that one as just something a little bit different. Fantastic. And what about um, roadblocks? Yeah, well, look, it, um, interestingly, uh, and again, as an organisation, we are gender balanced. We are 53% female. And that balance exists at every level in the organisation. So as a consulting organisation, um, directors is the most senior title within the organisation. We are only 32% female at our director level. 
So gender balance at all other, other levels except for director. So when it came to setting a, a, a target or an a, a expectation of 40, 40, 20 gender balance in leadership groups, one of the unintended consequences was the leadership distribution. We had a much smaller pool of women that we were asking to take on leadership roles within the company. And I guess a level of um, fairness and equity that was being experienced with a smaller proportion of men uh, was something that emerged for us. And at the time, I have to say, we were less than 30% um, directors within the organisation, so a small pool to draw upon. So that led us to implement a range of initiatives to unlock that. So in particular, we had a greater proportion of our part-time employees were female. So that led us to completely revise our targets uh, at, for um, uh, consulting practices uh, and how that dealt with part-time arrangements, um, regardless of gender, but to help create greater opportunities and accelerate pr promotion potential amongst our part-time uh, directors within the organisation. One of the other things that we introduced was a female sponsorship program. So it's now in its about to launch the fifth iteration, but we have a program at Urbis called SOAR, which is our female sponsorship program. So not a mentoring program, but a sponsorship program, I'm sure everyone's aware, to try and generate the same kind of opportunities that more naturally occur for men in the workplace with a very deliberate focus on sponsorship of women to support that acceleration through to create the greater um, female director pool to start to even that leadership distribution to achieve 40-40-20. Thanks, Ben. Now, just uh, as an aside, there's been some questions in the Q&A just about the criteria for the Employer of Choice for Gender Equality Citation. Um, if you have a look in the Session Information button, uh, there is a link uh, where you can learn more information for people who are participating today. Um, uh, you can both listen to the session and uh, and look at the criteria at the same time if you can multitask. Um, now, we know this isn't, you know, even just the roadblocks, it's not a straight journey. Um, mm. And you know, we will always try things and they won't work as well as we expected. So in, in that spirit, I'd like to ask each of the panellists, can you give an example where you've tried something that you thought was going to work and then perhaps it didn't have the the, the same response, the, the, the outcome that you expected? James, we'll kick off with you again. Um, sure. Um, a, a fair few years ago when I was running supercars, we uh, attracted probably the best female driver in the world. Um, Simona Di Silvestro had won IndyCar races, uh, was extraordinary had sponsorship, had backing, had funding, and you couldn't find a race team that actually would give her a reasonable seat. And within two years, she was snapped up by Porsche globally. And now I think if you fast forward to 2021 or 2022, there wouldn't be a race team that wouldn't want to, um, you know, put a capable driver in. So that's sort of one from the past. That was a few years ago. I think closer to home, and maybe it's a sign of the times, obviously at seven, it's the flexible work arrangements. And we're really struggling with a balance between people that need to be at work, you know, frontline news presenters, people that start, you know, work at 4.35 a.m. in the morning, right the way through to, you know, back office that potentially never need to be at work and how you bring that community together. So I think that balance, you know, particularly for, you know, working um, people with family is something, you know, that's a policy, um, you know, that we're struggling with. And it's probably confused a little bit with the, you know, the back to work and what that actually looks like in the longer term. And so, you know, that's providing a little bit of, you know, consternation here and something we need to keep on, you know, chipping away at to work out what the right mix is uh, going forward. Not, uh, I think I think that's a com common uh, challenge. Ben, I'll go to you next. Any, um, what about for you? Yeah, look, in a very similar way, I was going to use an example of flexible working as well. So, um, for us, we launched a policy in 2017 called Working Your Way, um, and that was our flexible working policy to start to give more empowerment to our people to work in a more flexible manner and have more control over, over what that meant. And uh, I have to say the take-up um, was uh, not that remarkable uh, whilst the framework existed. So for us, um, it was probably more of a cultural impediment or possibly a stigma to taking on those flexible work arrangements. So. That was a really interesting one for us. And I guess a pleasing um, follow up to that, though, is what we found during COVID is a real normalisation of hybrid working. 
uh, and now the take up of, of hybrid working. I mean, obviously we're all experiencing, we're all encountering and it's now the norm. So uh, in some respects, we were well set up because we've had the policy in place for a number of years. But what we've really seen is a massive take up now um, of the principles of our working, working your way policy. Fantastic. Um, yeah, needed a pandemic to get the shift we uh, we all wanted to see and needed to see. Liz, how about you? Yeah, maybe we've got a little bit of a different one that I can share um, today. Uh, look, we, we have a program uh, at Medtronic uh, called Talent X, and it's a talent exchange program uh, that we developed for the Asia Pacific region, um, really to facilitate um, a little bit of that cross border talent move and expertise sharing. Um, and we recognised that there was a bit of a ceiling on the senior leadership roles, um, senior and leadership roles, I should say, in, uh, in ANZ. And we anticipated that this program could uh, could have a bit of a positive uh, impact for us. Um, however, we found out that the the uptake was mostly from uh, a lot of the individual contributors. Um, and then, of course, we also had the pandemic hit that. Uh, so that kind of made us move to a little bit of a physical slash virtual exchange program, uh, which was a bit tough in the translation there. But um, those opportunities, and I think we we saw the, uh, the the limited uptake there, and it didn't really translate into that uh, uh, increase of female internal applicants, and and also that movement in the organisation to some of those senior leadership roles that that we had probably hoped for. Um, and, and look, probably the only other one, if 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 I could throw it in there, which we continue to work on, is our female um, uh, drop-offs there that I mentioned of those senior roles, and and that continues to be something that um, that we focus on because we know we can continue to improve uh, in that area as well. So yeah. Okay. Um, now a question. Uh particularly for, for Liz and Ben, um, because you either work uh, while you've got balanced teams yourself, you, you work alongside um, and with what are often highly gender segregated industries. Um, what do you think? And it, this is a, you know, this is a deep cultural issue, but, um, and James, you might have a view on this as well, if you'd like, uh, like to chip in, but, you know, to the panel, what do we need to do to address some of the gender segregation, either industrial in terms of you know where, where people work or occupational in terms of the hierarchy and, and the roles people take um, to, to make inroads to address um, what we have in Australia, which is one of the ho most highly gender segregated industrial structures in the OECD? I don't know who wants to kick off. Liz, do you want to kick well, off maybe, on that one? Yeah, maybe I, maybe I will. Um, look, I, it's a very interesting question, Mary, so thank you for that. Uh, and I think you're right. I think that when we look at um, uh, some of the gender segregation in particular industries and, and for our industry, um, the way we're trying to address that is really to think about um, redesigning roles to have the flexibility practices organically built into um, each and every role, right, as you mentioned there a minute ago, because I think that, um, you know, um, we need that all the way through to leadership roles um, so that we can actually, you know, get that um, uh, get that improvement in representation. Um, and, and that's what we need to kind of address the, the segregation. So, um, and I think the, we do, do need to move away from the notion that, that flexibility is only for some roles and for some people, because we've got to kind of build that in to, to address um, that situation. For us in particular, um, I think uh, also addressing a little bit more rigour in STEM, um, which in our field is science, technology, engineering and mathematics, for those of you uh, who probably know what that is. And for us in particular, um, having uh, having seen more, but we can do more uh, in that area of uh, women in med tech, um, whether that's around programs and, and scorecards as well, um, to keep ourselves on track. And, and that's probably one of the things um, that we need to really look at when you, when you look at some of the segregated industries. Okay. Ben, other thoughts? Yeah, look, uh, it's a great question. Um, and for us, how this plays out a little bit uh, is probably more in areas of our business like asset valuations and transactions where um, the graduate pool um, is heavily biased towards uh, men uh, in that regard. And so that's been a real challenge for us in terms of trying to achieve our gender balance 
um, in that particular area of our business. So a little bit likely is I think there's a, a big influence when it comes to education and school age education. So some of the things that we've been thinking about to try and correct that um, is, for example, we're um, very active with the Property Council and one of the Okay, projects. we've lost um, Ben for a moment. Um, so, sorry, Ben, we lost you just for one sec. So some of the things you've been thinking about? Yeah, sorry. Uh, my apologies. Uh, we are heavily involved with the Property Council of Australia and one of the great programs that they run is the Girls in Property program. Uh, so um, that's targeted at uh, school age females uh, and involves going into schools and um, providing insights, providing, um, encouraging um, you know, promotion of career pathways, using role models to really provide an insight as to what a career in property can start to look like. And the other side that um, the industry has also been working on as well is the Career Revive program. So looking at how we can encourage greater participation um, of women in the workforce um, after career breaks. So they're probably two of the things more structurally that, um, that we're investing in and focusing on to try and assist in breaking down some of that segregation and achieving the gender balance. Okay, great. Um, we'll just have a couple more for the panel and then we've got uh, some great questions in the Q&A that we'll come to. Uh, and can I encourage people to keep both putting their questions in and voting for the questions that you like. So it's great to be able to uh, see people engaging there. Interested to ask each of you, obviously the CEO has a critical role in terms of the leadership um, to in, you know, drive gender equality uh, and gender equal outcomes in workplaces. But who else in your organisation is vital to delivering uh, those improvements and, and making sure that, that you can um, achieve them? Uh, ben, do you want to start on this one? Sure. Look, um, very happy to. I, I don't think there's, um, I've got anything that profound, Mary. I mean, the obvious answer is everyone. Um, everyone is responsible. Everyone's accountable. But if we look at it being driven by culture, um, culture starts from the top. So that starts with our board, um, our leadership team. And we've also got a very active diversity and inclusion board, um, which I chair. Uh, and so they're very active, has great representation across the country, but also really active working groups. Um, and that's um, particularly the working groups are a newer initiative, but I, I found that really beneficial for me in terms of hearing, in addition to things like engagement surveys, that grassroots insight in terms of what's working, what's not, what's not, how can we fine tune some of our initiatives. So. Um, yeah, the, average, um, the obvious answer, everyone, but we place a lot of emphasis on accountability with our leadership teams um, and, uh, and our board. Okay. James? Uh, yeah, look, I absolutely agree with Ben. I mean, I think it has to permeate through the whole company. So, um, you know, similar answer to Ben, but, you know, you have to drive it. And that has to be through, you know, sort of the exec code, you know, your core executive leadership group and then it has to be you know sort of probably a run down and you know everyone needs to see it see it in action so by permeating it has to be part of scorecards part of metrics something that's addressed and something that's discussed and talked about you know you can't just say we're going to do this and you know and in some ways it's not it's any initiative really you have to really sort of you know drive the outcome so i think they're the most important things and i think we've probably got a more complicated step too and i could talk to you for hours about it which is we put out a product which is out there in the public and the public can see. So, you know, it's one thing to talk about it and do it in terms of back office, but you have to represent it uh, on the screen as well. And um, I can give you loads and loads of examples, but, you know, that's critically important to us for our organisation uh, to believe in it as well. And, and Liz? Yeah, look, I couldn't agree more with uh, with both Ben and James. It's really owned by everybody, and everybody can get involved. Um, but but uh, I think it does start with the leadership, and uh, and certainly we're moving to a leader led model for IDE. And I think I explained a little bit of that before. But um, we're shifting more of that responsibility into fully sitting um, with the leadership team and consistently. So um, a huge shout out to our leadership team for embracing 
embracing that and, and really driving that. Um, but also, uh, you know, part of that, even at our vice president level, um, we're really driving representation through very key leader-led action plans and being measured on those. Um, so priorities and that they have to be incredibly um, specific uh, for the, whether that's the business, the region or, um, you know, those support functions that we have in the organisations. So we, we make it very, very specific and we do report on those, as I mentioned before as well. So you've got to demonstrate um, how how that's going in the organisation because people, people want to see that and they'll feel that as well. So a strong theme about measurement as well there in terms of uh, accountability. And, and James, just to follow up your answer, and you mentioned it earlier as well, um, obviously the media can play an important role um, in really driving gender equality as a, as a um, you know, both in, in what you demonstrate, um, but also in the stories that you tell and the news that you report. Um, how much does you know what you're doing internally in terms of gender equality um, also feature, I suppose, in in how you think about um, your news, your stories, um, you know, what you're putting on uh, the media as a driver of change more broadly? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, Mary. I mean, we're the first media company in Australia to actually um, you know be awarded the citation. So I think that in itself, you know, I think is quite interesting. So. You know, I think I might have even said to you when we were pitching one time, our job is to actually provide awareness, you know, for, you know, the great work that WG is doing, you know, across the industry and to actually, you know, use our assets, our people and, and in fact, you know, sort of the citation to, you know, bring, you know, shine a light on it and, you know, bring it to the fore to companies that perhaps aren't. Um, not surprisingly, no other media company reported it, but you would like to think in the media sector we're all quite competitive uh, between each other that probably it was noted and I mean the, the amount of messages I got from both people on screen from other networks and also from executives or people I've known you know through the years being a relatively small industry um, you know I think was you know sort of quite extraordinary um, that it was recognized and in a tough market it's actually been you know one of those things that you know often people want to come here because uh, you know sort of because of the citation so you know I think for us it's actually what more can we do? Um, how can we drive, you know, the overall awareness of it? And how can we lead it? And, you know, it's, it's important for us now to set a high standard and to continue to do, you know, more. Um, you know, and, you know, I look at, you know, some of the examples, you know, to have Daisy Pierce, the first female um, effectively a commentator to be an experts commentator in a box of men calling football men's football, you know, was effectively a first in this country, if not, you know, in some ways around the globe. To have Annabelle Williams, a Paralympian, actually sit, sit alongside Bruce McAvaney and Ian Thorpe and call the Olympic swimming for able-bodied athletes. Ann Sanders, you know, still one of our key talent reading the news, um, you know, in the afternoons nationally. So we've got so many examples. Um, I think every single major news uh, branch for us has either a um, female anchor or a, or a co-host or a weekend reader, you know, in many cases. And so, you know, those things to us are really important that we are reflective, you know, across, you know, not just gender, but, you know, diversity, uh, you know, generally contestants, what we're doing around opportunities even with something like Australian Idol. So all those things are really, really important for us. And I suppose society judges us on what we put on screen and, and do you get the eyeballs and does it reflect reflect that in itself. Absolutely. It's great to hear. And and I might, um, because you've touched on it as well, the benefits, you know, how the citations helped. Um, to Liz and to Ben, um, has being an EOCGE citation holder, you know, supported you in the process? Have you found that, you know, obviously a lot of this stuff is embedded in terms of what you do and the and the and the leadership that you um, demonstrate? But how has the EOCGE um, process itself uh, assisted? So, Liz? Yeah, um, thanks, Mary. Um, so, yeah, look, definitely, it's uh, it's it's just such a great thing that uh, that we that we got to renew our citation. And as you mentioned up front, we had a bit of a break, so um, it's it's really important for us. Um, and I think it's really helped 
fit in and talk even more strongly to our organisation's uh, mission. And, and we've got a tenant um, that we have in our mission that really talks to the personal worth of all of our employees and our, commi our commitment there to, to advancing fair treatment and representation of genders, providing a framework that really focuses on proactive inclusion. So um, the citations kind of helped really bring that even more to life, which is which is great. Um, and, and honestly, it's really helped us have even more candid conversations and critically review our data. I'm, I'm a bit of a stigler on the data, um, but that is important because it helps identify and address opportunities and how we can keep advancing, um, you know, gender equity in the organisation. So um, certainly it, it it keeps us um, front and centre to what that means and, and, and how we do that. And Ben, as a new, you know, having just gone through the process, uh, what's it meant for you? Yeah, look, it, it's um, a great question. And, and uh, as you referenced, I mean, for us, we've only just been appointed, so it's all very new for us. But we've spent uh, a long time questioning, do we actually need the citation? Uh, and... Uh, we've had a, a, a gender diversity strategy in place since 2014. Um, but probably one of the key things uh, in the decision to go for it and to get the, the public recognition, one of the interesting things for us was the decision uh, to remove any qualifications for paid parental leave. So if we talk about the implications and how, how that drove the organisation, we had a 12-month qualification period in order to access um, 18 weeks paid parental leave. And in going for the citation, um, it uh, obviously required us to remove that. What was interesting was uh, without knowing this was a possibility, um, we uh, were also um, uh, looking at a senior lateral hire into our business, a senior woman, uh, who, as it turns out, as we progressed down the process, was also seven months pregnant. So for us, it was a really great um, opportunity to see the policy in action and the influence of the citation that um, that made the decision, I mean, there was no decision in terms of um, the ability to attract the person. But interestingly, it removed any stigma for them coming into the organisation and any feeling as though there was any special treatment. So for us, uh, it had uh, direct benefits in terms of the cultural change within the organisation. And, um, you know, that person came in, they're now on um, their paid parental leave, but um, they came in and in the six weeks they were with us before they went, um, had a huge impact on the organisation, um, was able to secure a range of new mandates for the business. So that was a really interesting um, uh, uh, change and opportunity that was driven for us. And for, I guess, the other aspect I'd say, which has been touched upon as well, and you made the, the comment in the introduction, Mary, the bar is always rising. And now by going for the citation, it makes sure that we're being held to account and always looking at how we can we can be better. And I'm just going back to the comments James made a moment ago, too, uh, we don't have the same public profile that, um, uh, that Seven West do, but um, you know, we are involved in shaping and designing the future of cities, which need to be inclusive, which need to be representative. So it's important for us to be able to fulfil that obligation and deliver better outcomes for our clients, that we are um, diverse and inclusive. So um, it does also drive and then multiply the, the impacts in the community as well. And James, any, anything further? I know you've commented it, uh, on it as part of the last question, but just anything further from the citation perspective for, for Seven West? Yeah, again, I agree, obviously, with Liz and Ben's comments, but I think for us it's a proof point, you know, that it is a collaborative, innovative, diverse and, you know, inclusive and safe place uh, for people to work. And I uh, echo uh, what Ben said, which is we have to live up to the high standards. And so as an example, only a week or so ago, and we're not the first to do it, but um, we introduced a fertility leave treatment um, policy you know, if we weren't continuing to improve uh, ourselves, you know, ourselves and, you know, sort of keep on raising that bar, we probably wouldn't have, you know, been doing something along those lines. So it's just that striving, continuing striving. Excellent. Now, I've got a very, very popular question um, from Joe, and uh, it very much follows the, the comments that everyone's just made, and it relates to intersectionality um, and how um, the view of gender equality, but for different women with um, other 
intersecting uh, um, aspects of their identity, be it you know disability or cultural background or sexual identity. Um, it may be indigeneity. Um, they have different experiences in the workplace. Um, how do you, and I'm happy to open it to all the panel, whoever would like to answer it, you know, how do you take into account, I suppose, going beyond gender and looking at, uh, the, you know, the further aspects of um, diversity and how it intersects with the experience of, of gender? Who wants to kick off on that one? Yeah, maybe I'll start, Mary. Uh, I think that's um, it, it is a fantastic question, and I think uh, you know even uh, when you and I were talking a while back, I think it is one of those things that still needs uh, a little bit of work. To be honest, um, I think uh, as we look at inclusion, diversity, and even equity, um, I think that uh, there are parts to that that really um, are need to be way more uh, considered and understand a lot more there so that we can bring more of that together. Um, I know uh, certainly uh, in, in our industry and, and particularly for Medtronic, um, we're trying to, uh, to, to get that representation. Um, we're, we're, uh, we've got a lot of employee resource groups where we're, we're listening and we're trying to understand that so that then um, we can see how that, uh, that then really kind of moves into some of the policies that, that we need to review and, uh, and maybe update as, uh, as we go along. So that's certainly one of the things and and, and I think it's a it's a great topic. It's uh, it's quite complex, <laughs> but uh, but I think there's uh, there's an approach that that we've certainly been looking at. Okay. Anything uh, else to the James? James, yeah. yeah. Look, I think for us, you know, Mary, um, you know, there's a whole range of um, you know action plans that we have in place. You know, from a seven perspective, you know, reconciliation action plan. You know, all of our work through ESG, charity organisations, um, CSAs. And an obligation, obviously, to you know, start the debate, so to speak. You know, I don't think a media company's role is to lead the debate. Um, um, you know, role is to actually make, you know, to bring the awareness to it, and to obviously, you know, sort of tell both sides of the story. And so again, I think you know, there's lots of examples, you know, in that around sexuality. Um, again, in terms of the indigenous plans that we have to really shine a light on it. And we've done that often through some of our stories, you know, when we have contestant groups, you know, through programs like The Voice or Big Brother or, um, you know, even Australian Idol, we get to tell the stories in a really innovative way, um, you know, which actually leads to, a, a, you know, a degree of awareness. So I think it's a balance, you know, it's diversity in all its forms, you know, really, um, you know, where, where we need to be inclusive and, and, and you know, pr provide that framework. Yeah, no, I might just add something, James, you made me think of something, um, because I think getting all of those perspectives in is really how we enrich our organisations. Um, and that's that's a key part that, that we've got to think about as well. Uh, look, my, my comments would be uh, not that dissimilar. I think the intersection for us is, is it comes down to culture and a culture of inclusivity. So we very deliberately a number of years ago moved our diversity board to be a diversity and inclusion board um, because we felt inclusion was uh, a really important cultural trait within the organisation. So I think the, um, the awareness, the tolerance, the celebration of difference that can come through that um, benefits all forms of diversity and inclusion within the organisation. I think the last question Mary was going to ask was, um... Uh, what's the one thing you would say to a CEO or executive listening to this session today yep. that they should take away in order to accelerate change in their organisation? So, Ben or Liz? I'm well, one, well, yeah, Ben, go for it. <laughs> Look, it's, um, it's interesting and maybe it reflects um, the size of our organisation uh, relative to yours as well, but we're only an organisation of 750 to 800 people. so. The advice for me, I think, is probably things that, that you already may be well underway with, but um, I would say you need to get granular. Um, we relied on goodwill and cultural change within the organisation for far too long, and that masks pockets where we weren't achieving the same results or driving the same change. So my advice would be, or our experience to really, because we did stagnate at one point, and it wasn't until we started to really get granular and set specific business unit and team targets 
Yeah. Um, and we're now in the process of linking that to REM and reward, which it sounds like you already do. Um, that for us um, would be my advice. We, it took us too long to get there. So getting granular with targets, linking into REM and incentives, because um, goodwill will only get you so far, would be my key yeah. piece of advice. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, Ben, uh, couldn't agree more. I think, I think also for for uh, for us, it's definitely, you know, things won't organically improve, right? So we've uh, we've got to make sure that we've got the analysis that that really identifies and recognises those gaps, so that we can work on those. And I think um, back to the point that I made before, having that concentrated, targeted effort, um, really to address the, those opportunities and and doing that in a purposeful way with those action plans. Um, you know, having that leader led um, makes a, a big difference as well, because then we're, we're really all modelling um, what we want to create and the culture that we're creating. So, uh, so I agree. And I think, um, you know, just as, as leaders as well, just encouraging everybody to get involved and, and owning uh, what that inclusion looks like, what that diversity looks like, what that equity looks like, and, and really kind of um, representing that uh, as much as we can, I think is, is great. And um, doing that at, at our quarterly business reviews or even in our dashboards or scorecards, as you mentioned as well, James, I think uh, they're the kind of things that, that, that are important and, uh, and it's constant work as well. So we've got to keep it top of mind. Yeah, I think from our perspective, you know, it's actually kind of being loud and proud, you know, so as a leader, it's not being afraid of it, um, you know, stepping into it. And, you know, sometimes, you know, particularly I can say as a male CEO, it's actually quite a daunting topic, you know, to talk about. But actually, when you do, uh, it's truly appreciated. And more importantly, you know, and even talking to, you know, sort of male executives, often they're quite nervous about it. Once you get into it and you talk about it, you know, quite often there are never the roadblocks. And in many cases, they're not even aware, you know, of what, you know, prejudices might even be there as well. So I think from that perspective, uh, it's just getting in there, doing it and and really making a, you know, make, making a core difference. I think um, we've got a question here in Mary's absence. Um, more women have taken up hybrid working what policies do you have in play to ensure women who work from home are not out of sight and out of mind? So, Ben, why don't you lead off? Yeah, look, um, for us, I referenced this a little bit earlier, our working your way policy that we've had in place uh, for a number of years is our, um, is our critical document. Um, look, it is a really interesting question, though, as, as hybrid working becomes more the norm. So it's not a gender-based response, but now that we have um, our entire workforce that is by and large working in a hybrid environment, I think there are some further policies that we need to consider. How do we adjust our learning and development platforms as a consulting based organisation? We largely operate in an apprentice based um, environment where you learn by seeing and doing. Um, so I think that's a really interesting one for us and aspects even of, of business development and other things. So we've got a core platform, but I think it's it continues to evolve and be a journey. Uh, and I think there's a lot more work that we need to do before we've got a, we can say that we've got hybrid working right. Yeah, I think uh, I think for us, we we certainly have um, flexible uh, work options. Um, we have a policy called Yes Flex, um, and uh, and that allows uh, you know so many of our employees to to utilise uh, where they need uh, flexible working. So um, that really kind of falls into the to the hybrid piece. But but we do other things as well, where uh, where the individuals may certainly be uh, hybrid or part time. Uh, we also have or you know working particular ways for for family reasons or personal reasons uh, we have check-in days um, so we do a lot to make sure that that we stay connected um, uh, so we have connect days and um, a little bit like you as well Ben we've we've really improved our digital platforms um, to be able to kind of get that uh, a connection and then be uh, making sure that that people have access to um, you know what Ways of working so that they can continue to do um, what they what they are uh, what their um, certainly their role is uh, is asking um, without any kind of interruption. So we've we've certainly got lots of different platforms that we use and, and policies that we have in place to help there as well. 
Yeah, I think from a certain perspective, as I said earlier, you know, we've got such diverse locations across Australia with particularly all of our newsrooms. And so it's finding the right balance. And it's also finding that the right balance to, you know, bring the teams in to collaborate together in, you know, quite a correct uh, creative industry as well. And so it's that sort of balance for us that we're obviously trying to get, um, you know, sort of get, get right. Um, the next question is, uh, can you list some broad steps a company needs to take to commence with gender equality if nothing exists in the company? Um, and I think to start off, you know, I'd encourage you to look at the criteria, um, you know, that Wagia, um, you know, has and it's probably, you know, sort of a good starting point in terms of some of the keys around, you know, what you would need to do to get a citation and what was regarded as best practice. Uh, and to also look at, you know, some annual reports and, you know, certainly what, you know, companies such as the 104, was it, or 114 members, uh, you know, sort of put through their annual reports and, you know, sort of think about some of the policies, um, you know, perhaps that don't exist uh, in, in those companies at the time. And there's a bit you might want to add to that. Yeah, I think uh, I think there's also a lot of secondary data um, out there that that uh, that can certainly help as well. Starting with some of the policies, um, you know, for for the companies is really a, a starting point as I see it. Um, uh, but yeah, I agree with you, James. I think there's such great uh, wealth of information on on Wujia, um, that can help uh, a lot of uh, organisations. It's a great starting spot. Look, I would agree, just adding to it a, a little bit, obviously getting a baseline um, is really important. So really understanding where you are today um, to help inform where you want to go. Um, for us, uh, and it's been ongoing for some time, as I'm sure it is for many, but um, unconscious bias training, I think, is really telling uh, and really helpful as leaders to understand some of your blind spots and start to drive change. And obviously, we touched upon this before in terms of accountability, but if your leadership team's not committed to this, um, you're not going to get anywhere. So I'd say a really important step too is making sure you've got alignment, buy-in and commitment of your leadership group. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm Lucy Bradlow. I'm the Executive Manager of Communications and Campaigns at Wajia. So I'm going to step in in uh, everyone's absence. Thank you, panellists, for stepping in. So I think um, there's quite a few questions in the comments about some really practical examples of what you've done to get to this place. So could each of you give us a practical example of an initiative or a policy that you've put in place that's really changed um, gender equality or bridged the gender pay gap at your organisation? Yeah, maybe uh, maybe I'll start. Um, so, in in terms of some of the policies, um, we've certainly uh, been addressing uh, some of those areas where we've seen uh, some of the uh, the requirements as as you know, pandemics helped, it, but uh, that well helped in a way. But uh, but I think also the the flexible work policies have really helped. Um, and I think also uh, when we look at uh, what we've been doing to really bring some of those goals into all of our um, uh, uh, work uh, so that we can really understand what everybody's doing towards uh, inclusion, diversity and equity uh, across the organisation in our how goals that I mentioned a little earlier. Um, but I can say that um, just in terms of um, some of the pay equity, we, we actually talk about equal pay for equal work and uh, happy to say that uh, that at Medtronic, a um, uh, like-for-like -like pay gap is 0.4%. Uh, so uh, we've done a lot of work to uh, to really kind of improve on that. But um, but I think there's a lot of policies that, that, that come into that. The slating um, uh, 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 you know, approach that I mentioned earlier as well. So um, there's lots of things that we're uh, we're certainly moving towards. Um, but uh, happy to say um, we really could do um, do make sure that that we're uh, looking at and standing behind that uh, equal pay for equal work. Great. And James or Ben? Sure. I mean, I mean, for us, it's you know it comes back to sort of measurable metrics and KPIs. You know, so put you know following those. Um, you know, through the company and, you know, sort of, you know, as a, as a core part of, you know, the leadership team and, and the reports, um, you know, sort of through the company and probably a real focus on training and improved policies, you know, so for an organisation, you know, that is, 
you know, getting to citation and, you know, leading the way, there is a lot of training um, as, as a big organisation um, and, you know, sort of improved policies. And I also think for us, there's a lot of, you know, the things that we do and support off screen. So whether that's International Women's Day, um, you know, White Ribbon, you know, a lot of our telethons, a lot of our foundations and a lot of the CSA work we do as well. So, you know, it is about actually um, using the platform um, to build awareness and, and to promote, you know, a whole range of um, causes from that perspective. Great. Yeah, look, I'd agree with the, the comments that have been made um, thus far, and we've covered a number of, um, a range of the policy considerations. One of the ones that hasn't come up um, that we've had to implement uh, is, and we're, as I mentioned before, we're a consulting-based organisation, um, is put in place uh, return to work frameworks. So as people transition out of the business um, for a period, um, how do we um, migrate that practice? But more importantly, if you've been out of the business for six months, 12 months, two years, how do you integrate effectively back into the business, particularly when you may have responsibilities for winning and delivering consulting mandates? So um, we've, we've got a very deliberate policy now that supports and puts in place mechanisms, expectations on managers, teams and individuals to transition out, but then transition back into the business. So that's that's another policy change we've had to implement. Yeah, I think that's so important. When we looked at our ages and wages research last year, we saw that one of the problems is that people, when they're coming back into the workplace, aren't getting those same opportunities to progress and move on. So those return to work policies are so important. Um, I think maybe a final question, and Mary's come back, so I'll just ask it, is we get asked by our employees a lot, um, what can I do? Like I see my leader doing a lot, but what as, can I as a mid-level manager or a, a senior manager, what can I do when I'm not an actual leader of an organisation? What can I do to help with gender equality in my organisation? How do you encourage your employees to be a part of the, the gender equality process? I mean, in, in, in our case, it's, um, you know, to be active, you know, so we, you know, we, one of our values is actually about speaking up, you know, so if you see something you don't like, you think broken can be done in a better way, uh, you know, we really encourage our employees to, you know, sort of step in and, and to lead. And a lot of the policies and a lot of the work we do um, are not done effectively by the executive team. We look to immerse into the business and have, you know, sort of committees and people that are, you know, sort of, you know, two or three rungs down, you know, from, you know, senior leadership um, to get a real view and a real focus from the business. Um, but as I said before, you know, like we haven't, like, like it's interesting, you know, it's, it's probably the older demographics that are more akin to the issues, you know, that and and you know, obviously the causes. And I think the younger demographic for them, there's a different, you know, sort of range of issues on their mind. And so it's a really interesting balance. And I think it's so important to have your organisation to have a pulse on your organisation versus, you know, to sit in an ivory tower and think that you might know, because um, often I think you're wrong. Yeah, look, I, I provide similar fa uh, feedback. The comment I immediately thought of was speak up. Um, you know, we don't know everything. There are things that we don't see um, that are really beneficial to help drive change within the organisation and make us a better organisation. And I'm also a firm believer, you know, the standard you walk past is the standard you set. So if you see something and you walk past it, you're just as responsible for the action that you're walking past. So. You know, it's a collective responsibility to drive cultural change within an organisation and create an inclusive culture. So, yeah, speak up and be part of what we want to be. Don't be passive. Mm. And I think for, for us, we certainly, you know, uh, encourage all of our employees in our how goal, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago, um, and some actions. So everybody gets involved in that. And we also have um, these uh, Medtronic mindsets, and one of those is foster belonging. So um, we really encourage everybody to, to get involved. Um, we've got a lot of employee resource groups. Um, we, uh, we also have one of those is the uh, Women's Network. We have men 
advocating uh, equity. So we've got lots of opportunities for people to get involved. Um, and we're also asking them to think about exactly exactly that. What can they do and how would they do that? So um, so we really encourage everybody to get involved. It's, it's, it, it's great to have the leaders behind it, but everyone can do it. Fantastic. Hey, I'm going to hand over back to my leader. <laughs> Jump back in. And uh, I've got to say, I loved, uh, loved James at the media guy. As soon as there was an issue, uh, stepped in to fill the fill the gap. And uh, Liz and Ben stepped up as well. So thank you very much for that. I Can won't I keep on my phone, Mary. <laughs> um, uh, versatile in all roles. Um, can I just ask on that last question as well? Because um, people want to speak up, but but what's critical is having that safe environment where people can have a say. And one of the um, AOCG requirements is that in staff surveys um, that there it, it is confirmed that the culture has um, you know that environment where people can can say things and can that gender equality is championed. How do you create the culture um, and uh, or continue a culture that uh, allows for that creative dissent, that allows for the, um, you know, someone more junior to speak up perhaps to their, their manager or through HR? Um, you know, what is it about the, the environment that enables that to be a safe thing for staff to do? Yeah, maybe I'll start. Um, look, I think it's um, we, we've certainly done uh, a lot of training as well, Mary, um, so that we can um, create uh, safe spaces. So leaders are encouraged to um, really kind of uh, have those tools so that they can work with their teams to be able to um, provide that safe space. Um, we've also got those mindsets that I mentioned that, uh, that we do encourage people to really think about uh, delivering results the right way and fostering belonging um, because we we want to make sure that we have that diversity and that inclusion um, so that we're hearing everybody. So part of that is the the actions that that go into even when you're having a meeting um, and just making sure that that you've got that. But we do uh, we do have some some great uh, training programs that we've uh, we've certainly um, uh, rolled out as well. So um, but but that becomes part of the culture, and I think that we uh, encourage that and. Uh, and certainly need to make sure that everybody's voice is heard. And, and sometimes uh, that means you've got to pay attention to that as well. Yeah, look, I think uh, it's, a, it's a really great question. Um, and I think it's using a variety of platforms and forums to create an environment for voices to be heard. Um, and one of those, which I'm sure most organisations do, is, is through things like workplace surveys. But it's a live issue for us because one of the things, whilst we're very proud of our engagement score, there was a slight differential that opened up for us on, on some of these areas more recently. So we're very focused as a diversity and inclusion board on the moment at the moment on psychological safety and how we can build greater psychological safety um, and, and get our leaders demonstrating greater vulnerability, approachability, um, asking others to contribute to try and create those safe environments so it's a live one for us that i couldn't say we've well i hope to see it corrected in our next engagement survey but it's a work in progress you know i think for us um behind me that colored page there is you know effectively our values which are be brave better together and make it happen and so we run a quarterly program based on those awards both for individual and for teams and we talk specifically to those areas and similar to ben and liz you know take a take a very regular pulse and anonymous surveys in terms of the business which you know to your point you know uh, mary one of the criteria under the wajia uh, citation and so that also helps inform the whole people and culture program um, of what we then roll out and how we celebrate it and you know, often we have you know, a lot of, um, you know, guest speakers and, you know, people that actually, you know, come in and talk, well, either virtually, or it's mainly been virtually, of course, through the COVID period, but talk to the staff and, you know, we try and, you know, live all those values and, you know, make sure that people can speak, you know, very openly, uh, you know, to, to their managers and, you know, to me, to anyone they want around things and issues that they see. And, and, and it's a very challenging environment at times, uh, which is good. That's what we want. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll wrap the panel up there. I just want to say an exceptional thank you to James and Liz and Ben. Uh, I think that's been a really interesting session. I really appreciate your frankness and your openness and honesty in sharing um, both the, the, you know, the, the good things and the, and the challenges uh, as people, um, you know, as part of your journey, but as people go on this journey in their own organisations. Um, uh, and hopefully, uh, and I know we asked the question at the end a bit earlier in terms of, you know, leave people with uh, one thing to do differently. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully people can have some takeaways from today. Um, just to wrap up from my perspective, um, in addition to, to really thanking the panel for both, um, you know, being today, but, but the work and leadership that you show um, in your businesses, in your industry, um, and the difference you're making for, you know, for all people in, in relation to gender equality. Um, we have a number of, and there's been some questions in the chat as well about um, Wajia's role and in some areas, um, particularly on that question of intersectionality and diversity. Um, we are doing work currently to collect uh, more information, uh, including uh, aspects of diversity um, in our data set. We already have the best data set in the world in relation to gender equality, but um, working with employers to, in the first instance, for them to create a safe environment to collect that information and then be able to re report um, at an individual employee level uh, things like uh, disability, uh, cultural background, um, indigeneity, uh, sexual orientation and, and so on. Um, we're also collecting uh, gender more broadly than men and women. We also collect non-binary and we're doing some more work in relation to that as well. Um, employers currently report that voluntarily to us and uh, over time that will become another uh, requirement in terms of the information that we collect. Um, we're also excited that the legislation is going to, um, one of the main things it'll do is enable us to publish gender pay gaps at a employee uh, employer level. Uh, so for uh, currently we publish them for industries and for across the board. Um, but uh, on this reporting data of just session that's about to commence, um, we will use that information to publish uh, early next year uh, individual employer gender pay gaps, um, which we think will be an opportunity we see to work with employers about driving the change that's needed and, and supporting them to be able to do it. And we are restructuring the way we work to um, be able to work alongside and support employers um, to drive that change uh, and have the education and tools and resources to be able to support as well as direct support. Um, but that will also bring a, a spotlight and a transparency to uh, gender pay gaps and and what companies are doing to um, to improve. So, good challenges um, and exciting times ahead uh, to continue the momentum on gender equality, which is um, what we're all seeking. So, thank you everyone um, for your participation uh, on the session today. Uh, thank you to the panel once again. Um, this session will be, as I've said, on YouTube and up on our website if people want to look at an aspect or um, reflect on it uh, in, again in the future. Um, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today.